Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So check it out on the screen. What does it say? I have doubts. I am excited to do this little mini-series here with you guys, answering this question or talking about what does a Christian do when they're struggling with some doubts. And that's where we get to this. Then the 11 disciples left Galilee going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, some did what? Worship. And some did what? Doubted. So in this room today, there's both categories. There are people who, God's word says it, I believe it, that settles it. And then there's other people in this room today that say, man, I've tried some of the stuff that the Bible says, and it doesn't seem to have worked. And sometimes when people have doubts, it's not that they have unbelief or that they want to walk away from the faith, it's just, I've got some questions. I've got some questions about this Bible. I've got some questions about some sermons that I've heard and the way that I was raised as a kid in church. And is it okay to ask questions? Or do I look faithless if I ask questions? So I want to kind of meet you where you're at today. Have you ever had doubts? Like real doubts. Like, is God real? And is Christianity the right religion? I mean, doggone, I'm just human, like, and I've studied theology, and I'm in college even still, and I'm just kind of like, man, is everything I taught real? Wonder if we're wrong. Wonder if we got this thing wrong. Do we believe the right things? Have we been deceived into Christianity? Was I forced into believing this as a kid, and there's no other hope, and there's no other beliefs? And personally, I love the fact that that little detail is in Matthew 28. That even the disciples, some worshipped and some doubted. Some worshipped and some doubted. Because it makes me feel better when people are worse off than me. It makes me feel better when other pastors say that no one showed up at their church on Sunday. Like, that makes me feel good about myself. That makes me feel good about myself. Come on, somebody. You know it, too. You know it, too. Kids are going crazy today. You love those kind of social media posts. You're like, yes, my kids were good today. I beat them. <laughs> Come on. We like it a little bit, right? I golf a lot. I really enjoy golf. And I, I'd, be, I, I'd be a liar if I said that I don't feel a little bit better about myself when someone else duffs a shot. Yes. They're not going to beat me on this hole. Right? I feel a little bit more confident in my swing knowing that they did bad. And I think that's kind of why the Bible shows us the failures of others. Not so much that we get prideful and say, man, I'm so much better than the disciples. Because we're not. But it shows us that they're human and we're human. They had some doubts. But it didn't disqualify them from leading the mission of Christ and founding the churches of God and spreading the gospel across America. So let's be vulnerable and transparent for a moment, okay? And I don't know if you can relate to this. But there have been times in my life that God feels so real to me that I can almost touch him. And then there's been other times that I can be in the middle of a worship service and I'm watching a bunch of people cry and I'm like, are we just making this up? Did we just hit the E minor chord just right? And you know those minor chords in church service with the haze machine and the lights, all of a sudden we think it's the Holy Ghost. But was it just the E minor chord with the seven on top? You play the E minor seven, all of a sudden, oh, the Holy Ghost is here, I got the chill bumps. Was it that I turned the AC down to 67 right before we started? Was it really God? Or is it something that we've rehearsed and put together and it was just excellence? 
Because there's a, there's a very fine line between talent and anointing. I think there's a danger in churches where people get so talented that they forsake the need of the anointing. Because there's been times that I've prayed to God for an answer to a problem and he didn't show up. Or he didn't show up the way I wanted him to show up. It can be really, really scary and lonely to have questions in the church world. Because we can get to a place where we begin to have some questions, we begin to have some doubts, and then we ask ourselves, am I the only one? Am I the only one that wasn't confused about the vaccine? Well, okay, I know. I went there, sorry. We cut that from the online feed. And if I ask questions, am I a conspiracy theorist? And if I ask questions about the Bible, am I in sin? And if I ask questions about God, am I wrong? See, you get what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe people just have some questions, but they don't feel safe asking them in church. I don't want to feel guilty and I don't want to feel ashamed asking questions of God. And my 28 years of ministry experience has taught me this. There are some people leaving the church not because God isn't good and they don't love God, but, be, but because they have questions that they don't feel safe asking. I'm convinced that there are some people that just don't feel like they can safely express their doubts. And so I want to look at this over this series. The number one reason why I think people have doubts is because there are questions that you cannot answer. I have some questions that I can't answer. Here's one, ready? One that kind of annoyed me this week. My parents were here this week. They live in Florida, they live just below Tampa. And uh, they were here this week and there's a hurricane coming right at their house, right? And so all week long we had the weather channel on because we got to track the weather. Got to see what's going on with hurricane, was Ida, Edie, and Adalia? I don't even know. It's in, we're in the eyes, so. It goes from a hurricane category two to a hurricane category four. Got to track this thing. And then I start having some doubts because there's a story in the Bible where Jesus stands on a boat. And he says, if you had faith... You would speak to the wind and the waves and they would obey your command and they would cease. And I don't know, did anybody pray about the hurricane? Did not anybody stand on the shores of Florida and say, wind and waves cease and go in Jesus? Like, did nobody do that or did people do that and it just didn't stop? Did people pray and then it didn't touch their house? See, see just some questions. And I'm not saying that God isn't real and God isn't true and that his word isn't true. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, is it safe to ask questions with Christians or are we going to get beat up and are we going to get shamed into stop asking questions? And so I think people leave church because they don't want to be a heretic. They won't want to be dubbed, faith, dubbed faithless in the midst of questions. Sometimes there's just some things that seem unfair. I prayed about it and it didn't happen for me. We have questions like, does God love me? Like, does God love me and if he loved me, then why am I experiencing the pain that I'm feeling? There's innocent children being hurt in America. Does God care? Where is God? So that's one question. That's one, one thing. Like, I can't answer everything. And I'm going to promise you in this series, I'm not going to answer every question that you have. I just can't. But then we have the other side of religiosity that says, well, the mysteries belong to the Lord. We'll find out when we get to heaven. And I understand that and I get that, but I want to know now. Here's the other side. Maybe... There are hurts in your life that you just can't get resolved. The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. And I've been casting and casting. I'm casting so much. My arm is tired. and 
I still have this pain in my life. I'm still trying to resolve trauma from my childhood and I don't feel like I've gotten the victory yet. And we have a question like that. And if we have a question like that and we're honest like that, then someone says, well, you're just lacking faith. If you haven't gotten over it yet, then you're just lacking faith. But maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe, maybe there are people who have been very faithful to God. They just have questions. I'm trying to get over this, but the pain is real. Maybe you've looked up to someone in the church world and they let you down. Maybe you thought church was a safe place to express your feelings and your hurts. And someone stabbed you in the back and told your business. And you realize that maybe church isn't a safe place. Maybe you've talked to a Christian to try to help, to, to get some help, and they just made the situation worse. It's like my wife and I, we lost our third child. And I went to some elders of the church and I told them the pain that I was going through. And they said, well, you know, maybe it's just not God's will. And so they thought that that was somehow comforting to me, but it pissed me off. And it made me angry at God. Like, why would it not be your will for me to have a son? Come on, somebody. They thought they were helping me and giving me some good Christian lingo. But yet it inflicted a deeper wound and it took 10 years for me to kind of heal that wound with my relationship with God. There are some Christians that I would just say don't have much grace. I saw a funny post yesterday on Instagram, and it says, when you don't respect someone from another church, it's called gracism. And I think there's a lot of people in the church world that live in gracism. Like, you know what your sins and struggles are, and then you judge somebody differently for theirs. I would call that gracism. There's just some questions, theological questions that we feel let down about because maybe the church hasn't done a good enough job answering them. Maybe we've talked to other Christians and expressed our doubts, but there's no bend. You know, they want to quote one scripture, the only one that they know. And there's no bend to kind of see your angle or your concerns. But here's what I know. Now we're going to turn the corner, right? So I'll let you all be faithless and I'll let you all feel good about yourselves doubting and having more faith than me, right? We're there. But here's what I know. The strongest faith is a faith that grows through your doubts. A strongest faith is a faith that grows through your doubts. It's when you don't just doubt, but you go find out, and it builds a stronger faith because now I know for myself. Now I know for myself. This isn't something that my mom and dad taught me. This wasn't coming out of a sermon that Pastor Mike shared. I got into scripture and I found this out for myself. That's a solid faith. That's a strong faith. So today we're all going to feel better about ourselves and we're going to look at someone in the Bible who has been dubbed a name, a nickname, from one moment. And man, I would love to go through each of our lives and pick like our worst moments, like on the worst highlight reel, and that becomes your nickname. How cool would that be? But there's a guy in the Bible, in the book of John, his name is Thomas, but what's his nickname? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Could you believe that? From one story, one situation, he is forever doubting Thomas. I mean, could you imagine drunk Dave? <laughs> glutton, glutton Bob. Right, come on. Doubting Thomas. Let's look at this. Now, Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So where was he not? He was not with them. He was not there. The other disciples were there. And therefore they said to him, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. Now the statement in the Greek is in a tense called 
an active verb. An active verb. So they did not just say, we've seen the Lord. What they said was, we've seen the Lord, 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 we've seen the Lord. Seen the Lord. Yeah, we've seen the Lord. It's like when you go on a trip with your kids. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I got to go potty. I got to go potty. I got to potty. I just peed my pants. <laughs> They're saying it kind of over and over and over again. It's just kind of annoying to him. And what does Thomas say? Anybody know the story? John 10, 25. I won't believe unless I see. The nail wounds in his hands. I won't believe. Unless I put my finger into them, I won't believe unless I place my hands into the wounds on his side. And before we get all indignant and calling him Doubting Thomas, I want to inform you today that Michael Jackson is alive. <laughs> Michael Jackson's alive. He's alive. Michael, he's alive. He's alive. You believe me? And you would not believe Jesus was alive either. In fact, I have a concern that when Jesus actually does appear and Jesus does return, we won't believe. We won't believe. Give me DNA. Give me Ancestry.com. Because we don't know what to believe. We don't know what to believe. We don't know if the things we're putting on our body are safe for us and protecting us. We don't know what to believe. So now this thing comes on the news. Jesus is alive. He's returned for his church. Oh, come on. He's not doing that for another 3,000 years. The church isn't perfect. We're not without spot or wrinkle. And we're going to look for all the reasons why it's not Jesus. So to think that in, Thomas wasn't there and the only reason why the other 11 believed, because they were there. If Peter and Thomas weren't there, and 10 were there, guess what? Two would have doubted. No. It already told us in Matthew that Jesus appears on the mountain and some worshiped and some doubted. It didn't say just Thomas doubted on the mountain. It said some. That there were multiple people who doubted. Because it's hard to believe. And by the way, Elvis is alive, just so you know. Doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, here's what I know, we believe that which we see, we believe the things that we see, and my dad always told me this, he said, son, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see, and I think it's even worse now, because now we have something called deep fakes, heard of this stuff, deep fakes, we got AI now that they can animate and automate you with your voice and your, and your facial expressions and it looks like a video about you. Man, it, I believe the greatest ploy of the enemy over the next few years is going to be lies and deception and we will have no idea what's true. We'll have no idea. So it's okay to have questions. And it's okay to bring those questions to the Lord. Here's something that I want you to understand today. God doesn't need you to defend him. He stood alone before Pontius Pilate. Nobody was there kind of defending him. He didn't have a lawyer. And he doesn't need you to defend him now. But they won't believe what I'm saying. Then that's on them. But we've got to convince people. I don't have to convince anybody. You don't have to believe a single word I say. You could go to another church that teaches exactly what you want to hear. Right? No, your responsibility and my responsibility is to find out the truth of the word of God for myself. And when I stand before the Lord all by myself, and you stand before the Lord all by yourself, it would have helped that we ask some questions before we get there. <laughs> Let me tell you something about faith. Faith is seeing the unseen. Faith is seeing the unseen and that's what's very hard because a lot of people who don't ever really tap into their creative mind have a hard time stepping into faith. Let me give you an example. 
I like to build stuff. I like to create rigging and hang speakers and, and do things like that. And, but before I make it, before I manifest it with my hands, I have first seen it in my head. I have drawn it. I have, an ima I have imagined it. And then I may sit down on a piece of paper, and from what I see in my mind, I begin to put it on paper. I actually have a, I have a glass wall in the office, and I'll draw stuff out. And then I'll draw like a concept out, and then I'll draw a different concept out, and then I'll draw a different concept out, and then I've got three options, and then I kind of play with them. But that's what faith is. Faith is seeing it before you see it. Right? You believe in God for healing, but can you see yourself healed, or do you only see yourself in pain? Someone's believing God for a new car. Do you see yourself driving a new car, or are you just annoyed every time you have to drive your jalopy? Right? Because what faith does is faith goes on the internet and prints out a picture of the car that they see themselves driving. And they put that picture in front of them. But isn't that just being vain and just being, you know, lustful and, and no, it's faith. You're painting the picture of what you're already seeing inside of you. The scripture tells us, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Right, so this is God's will. So we don't want it, we, we don't need to settle for less than a prosperous body and a prosperous life. Come on somebody, this is good. But we have to see it before we see it. We have to envision it before we see it. That's what faith does. Faith is not moved by feelings and emotion. Faith is only moved by the word of God. All right. All right. I believe that there's some others like me in the room today that can relate to Thomas. And here's what I think about Thomas. I think Thomas was a realist. I think Thomas had some common sense. And so his common sense told him, I watched Jesus be tortured to death, and now you're telling me that he's walking around. Just like I watched the gurney be carted out <laughs> of Michael Jackson's mansion. Right? He's dead, 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 dead. And Jesus was dead, 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 dead. I'm a realist. I'm using rational thought process. And then he says... But I want to know. But I want to know. I don't believe it, but I want to know. I'm doubting what you're saying, but I do want the truth. Anybody can relate to this? I have questions. And I'm guessing it's because Thomas has been through some stuff. I think Thomas has been lied to before. I think Thomas has had some disappointments in his past. Had some heartbreaks. Maybe he was in a relationship one time and I love you, I love you, I love you, and then she cheated on him. I'm making all this up. I don't know. But I know that he had some very sincere, complicated questions. And I want to tell you this. Just because you have some questions about faith doesn't make you a bad person or a sinful person. It makes you human. In fact, Oswald Chamber, a great uh, writer, said this. Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. You know, Christianity hasn't called us to not have a brain. Your doubts do not disqualify your faith. So let's look, if we think that Thomas was a doubter, if we think that Thomas had no faith, I want to look real quick at like two little stories about Thomas. Is that okay? In John eleven sixteen, 16, then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, so he's the only one saying it, hey, let's go that we may die with Jesus. And Peter's like, bro, no. But he's not doubting Peter. He's not faithless Peter. I mean, this is not a lack of faith. Let's go that we may die with Jesus. That's very, very full of faith. Huh? That's bravery. Yes? No? Okay. It's not fear, it's courage. They're going to kill Jesus? Well, let's go too. Then there's another time in John 14 where Jesus is like, hey, I must go away. 
and prepare a place for you that you may be with me also. And they're like, oh, where's that? And Jesus is like, well, it's in heaven. And they're like, well, how do we get there? Oh, you die. Ooh, okay. So if I was like, yo, after church today, yo, we're all going to go to Chester. We're going to go Cruci Frito. We're going to have some lunch. Yeah, I want to go. How do we get there? Oh, you die. If you die, then you can appear with me at Cruci Frito. Huh? Well, that changes things. That changes things a little bit, right? Right? That's like the chicken and the pig. You ever heard the story of the chicken and the pig? The chicken and the pig see this little kid starving. They're like, man, we need to figure out how to feed this child. And the chicken's like, I've got a great idea. Let's give her ham and eggs. And the pig's like, whoa. And the chicken's like, what? This kid is starving. And the pig says, well, chicken and egg, you know, um, eggs and ham is just a small sacrifice for you. But it's full commitment on my side. I want to go where you are, Jesus, but I got some questions. Is it going to hurt? How do I got to die? How big's my mansion? Right? So I'm going to go prepare a mansion for you. How big's my mansion? What color is it? Huh? We got marble floors or are we just talking concrete? I don't want no stamp concrete. I'm just saying I've got some questions. I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but he had some sincere questions. We sing songs, I give you my life, God. Really? Or do I give you the next 30 minutes of my life since I'm here anyway? These are some real questions. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Easy. Sell everything. Sell your house, sell your car, sell your motorcycle, sell your boat, get rid of it all, and you don't even get to enjoy it. Give it to the poor. Then you can come follow me. Man, I got some questions. I got some questions. You got 401k? You got life insurance? No? I mean, I know, guys, we can read the Bible. We can be so hard on them. But what if it was us right now? I'm going to need some details, Jesus, before I say I'm going to heaven. Here's what I'm going to look at today. When you're in the middle of a moment of doubt, it's a time to keep pressing in. When you find yourself in a moment of doubt, it's time to keep pressing in. As I begin to close, I want to look at this, the outcome of this conversation about doubting Thomas. Catch up in John 20, verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were gathered in a house together. And who's with them? Thomas. See, if Thomas doubted, he would have been out. And I, listen, you guys are full of it. I, I ain't doing this no more. I'm going. I'm going to go back to what I was doing. No, but he kept showing up. You guys are getting together. We're going to pray. We're going to meet. I'll be there. I've got some doubts, but I'm going to show up. Thomas is there. Even though he doubted, he's there. Now watch this. Jesus came. Jesus arrives. The doors are shut, but he stood in the midst of them. All right, y'all listen. That's some spooky stuff. I ain't going to lie. I ain't going to lie, okay? You're hanging out at a house party. You got the doors locked. You got the ADT on. You got the Sloman shield protecting your house. And all of a sudden, boom, Jesus is standing right in the middle of your living room. Ah! <laughs> this is why Jesus says what he says. Peace be with you. It's like, yo, chill out, chill out. Chill, bro, it's me. It is me. Chill, relax. Stop freaking out. Because they're scared. They're hiding. They're hiding because they don't want to be killed too. And Jesus appears. Peace be with you. Now let's look at this. This is huge. Out of anyone he can talk to first, who does he approach? 
So if Thomas was disqualified and Thomas was in sin and Thomas had no faith, I think you should go talk to someone else first. Thomas, doubter, trust me. Now watch. Then he said to Thomas, his first approach is the one who needed him the most. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and put your hand on my side. Do not be unbelieving but believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Even in the middle of his doubts, Thomas showed up and put himself in a position to see God. I applaud some of you today. You're here, you showed up. Even in the middle of maybe some of your doubts and some confusions and hurts. Maybe you lost people. You've prayed for people and didn't get answers. You've been through some real stuff, but you showed back up. Maybe you're watching online and you're showing up online. And I want to look at this. How did Jesus respond to a doubter? One of his own boys. One of the closest to him. How did he respond? Jesus came to Thomas and gave Thomas exactly what he needed. The exact things that he needed. He said, right here, Thomas. Right here, Thomas. Is this what you needed? Is this what you needed? I'm here. I'm not casting you away. I want to draw you close. I'm not abandoning you in the middle of your doubts. I'm satisfying your curiosity. But Thomas was in a position to meet Jesus. We got to put ourselves in a position to meet Jesus. And if all we do is run from God, and all we do is hide from God, and all we do is, you know, stop reading our Bibles, stop praying, never put ourselves in a position to learn more, we will not be in that place when God does arrive. God is not threatened by your questions. He's not threatened by your doubts. He wants to meet you right where you are in every season of your life. But there's one catch. There's one catch into building faith. The Bible tells us that every single one of us have been given what's called the measure of faith. A measure of faith. And, and my personal theological belief on that is that every single person is born with just enough faith unto salvation. Faith to get saved. It's the mustard seed faith. There's faith in all of us to say, man, I want to know where I came from. I want to know what my creator is. I want to know if there's an afterlife. And all that curiosity and those questions is enough faith to find Jesus. But if you want to begin to build that next level faith, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that kind of faith comes only after you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your spirit becomes alive unto God. It begins to understand and receive the word of God to build that faith in your life. It's strengthening your inner man. It's strengthening your spirit. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you've never taken that step towards God, I invite you this morning to join the seven others who gave their lives to Christ in first service. And here at Family Church, we take that step towards God by praying a prayer. The Bible tells us that we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Believing in our heart that he is our Lord, but confession, it says, is made unto salvation. And so if you're here today or you're watching online and you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd love to pray that prayer with you together. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen.
Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Thank you.